Hi guys, it's been a while. Um, I was busy exams and all that. And, well, the I've read a lot of historical fiction books. I've read historical fiction books about the American Civil War, about the water crisis in Kenya, and etc. But I really haven't read something about the Korean culture, a historical fiction book about the Korean culture. I don't think I've read anyway in my memory. And this is a Korean historical fiction book. Hello, full bookquesters! It is I, Aaron the Bookquester, and today I got this awesome book, When My Name Was Kyoko, by Linda Sue Park herself. And well, let's get right on to it. The book is based back when in the Japanese occupation of Korea, which is when Japanese ruled Korea with an iron fist, and it was bad. It was really bad times at the time for the Koreans. And basically, the book has two perspectives. Sun Hee and Tae who are two brother, brother and sisters, teenagers who live in Korea, who are Koreans. And okay, so basically the book goes through a lot of the injustices and the really hard rule that the Japanese poured on the Koreans. Like, like I lived in Japan for several years, so I have nothing against Japanese people, but just at the time, Japanese people to Korean people in the Japanese occupation, it was kind of horrible. And if we continue on, so basically, it's about a girl named Sun Hee who is very shy, who's very oppressed just because she's Korean and because she's a girl. And there's a little bit of feminism as the book goes on, as she like she becomes more resilient. She goes through really hard times, but we'll go into the details right about now. And we'll start with several major plot points or major things that the Japanese did in order to oppress and get rid of, stamp out Korean culture. One of the first things that happened in the book was when the Koreans were forced to change their names into Japanese. Of course, the emperor said, We are graciously allowing the Koreans to take beautiful Japanese names or something along those lines. However, the Koreans were infuriated. They had names. They had beautiful names. And they were being taken away that right to even have a Korean name. But they were Koreans and they were taking away their identity. And the son he's uncle was very, very angry, and he didn't want his name to be taken. But son he's father, who is the vice principal of a school, a great scholar, he goes on and he says that these names has no meaning to us. Therefore, we should close our eyes, get the, get the Japanese alphabet, and the first letter we pick will be the first letter of their names. As for their last name, he chooses a name that fits their Korean name, which is Kim. Kim means, well, gold, and gold is for kings. And basically what Sun Hee's dad, uh, dad did was he made a Japanese version of Kim, and he called it Kaneyama, which basically means gold mountain, which is a nice rural name that has the meaning of their Korean name within it. As for their first names, Sun Hee chooses Keoko, and, and Sun Hee's brother Taeyeol chooses the name Nobu. And they're forced to change their names. Imagine being forced to change your name that you'd had for over a decade since you were born. Imagine the feeling of anger, of, of injustice, and thinking all of these things. Why is this happening to me? Why would they take my own identity, my name? And I feel like it really conveys that really well through the book while also showing some major things that the Japanese occupation did while, you know, the Japanese were ruling Korea. And there were a lot of beatings, and basically one time, their uncle, who's a very patriotic Korean, like, he scratched out a lot of names in the newspaper, because in the Olympics, a man, a man had, well, he was a very good runner, but they had changed his name from Korean to Japanese, and he was flying the Japanese flag. And basically what Uncle did was he went along, and he scratched out the Japanese name that the Japanese had put on the Korean runner, and changed it back to his original name. He was beaten up very badly for that, and a couple bones were broken. And we can see how deadly and how of a tyrannical rule the Japanese had over the Koreans at that point of time. And no, literally no Korean culture was allowed. It was very, very unjust. One time, the Japanese came in and they were planting cherry trees. And cherry trees are beautiful and all, but they were burning 
all of the Sharon trees that was in people's gardens. And Sharon trees, they represent Korea. They have, they are, well, they represent the Korean culture. But cherry blossoms, they, well, they are the symbol of the Japanese. But Keoko, well, Sunhi and Taeyo, they resist. They dig up a small Sharon tree and they hide it in a piece of junk. I believe this kind of symbolizes um, the Sharon tree. I believe the Sharon tree kind of symbolizes the Koreans and the junk that's covering the Sharon tree to hide it is kind of like the Japanese occupation. It's like the Sharon tree is still alive. The Korean culture is still alive. It's growing. It's slowly growing and it's being oppressed by all that junk. The Japanese occupation, but it's still growing and it's still alive, and that is what matters. And I believe that's a nice little symbolic thing that I put in there because you know this is the book for my English class, so I had to do a little bit of analyzing. Might as well say some of that and stuff. And then some major plot points. The Jap. So basically, basically their uncle worked began to work with the resistance, and and because of Sun He's false alarm, unfortunate false alarm. Their uncle runs away, and the Japanese become suspicious, investigate, and find out that their uncle is a fugitive. And because of that, one of the Japanese soldiers take Tail to interrogate him. And finally, he doesn't want to tell them about their uncle, and he, he thought that they might realize that he was lying because he was being very, very uncomfortable. So he said that he was joining the Grand Army, the Imperial Army of the Japanese, so that he, they would not question him further because, well, if he was volunteering, or volunteering for the army, he was very patriotic, and they should like clap it on the black back and all that because you know he's dying for them. And because of that, Taeyo is forced to go to the Japanese army. And at the Jap at the Japanese camp, he he hears the Japanese commander saying that, "How will we take Koreans, Koreans who are cowards, to this mission?" And Taeyo, very angry. He stood up and he said that he would volunteer for the special operation, and it would require him to the ultimate sacrifice. Of course, what he had volunteered for was the kamikaze. The kamikaze were so excited pilots who ate one last meal, said bye to their families, and crashed their planes into enemy planes. It was it raised the spirits of the Japanese soldiers, and also it did massive amounts of damage to the American fleets. In World War Two, that's a little bit of history lesson right there. And Tail had volunteered for that. And afterwards, we find out that Tail has died in the Kamikaze mission, and Sun He is in grief. And after months after Tail died, Japanese loses the war. Well, they knew Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and well, yeah, and they worked off. The Americans won the war, and Korea was liberated. The book ones was Korea being liberated, but Tail is gone, and Sun He's really really sad. However, big plot twist: Tail returns. What had happened was that the day Tail had gone on his kamikaze mission, it was very very cloudy. Therefore, the mission was canceled. He was then thrown into jail. He was then thrown into jail in absolute disgrace, and everybody forgot about him. Then the war was over. The Americans won, and Tail was sent back home. And then at the end, Tail decides that he wants to be a printer to honor honor his uncle's memory of working with the resistance and as they now find out, their father's memory because his their father apparently wrote resistance articles about education, about Korean education, not the Japanese oppression education. And that is pretty much all of the book. And one, one piece of horrible, disgusting history is that, uh, ja well, there's a scene in the book where a couple of the older high school students, uh, high school girl students were taken and were told that they would work in textile factories in Japan. Um, that's a really dark piece of history, but I'm just going to say it anyway. Basically, what happened was that the Japanese Imperial Army took a young girls in order to satisfy the uh, sexual needs of the Japanese soldiers. And it was a very, very disgusting and, and absolutely completely illegal practice. And, based, and there's actually a little part where it explains that in the afterwards section, in the author's note section, where it says that, yeah, yeah, they were forced to serve as comfort woman 
who were satisfying the sexual needs of the Imperial soldiers. And it's a little bit of horrible history right there, but I believe we should move on from that. But I believe the Japanese should actually address that because apparently they still hasn't addressed the fact, which is kind of stupid, but we aren't getting into politics here. And all in all, I believe this book is about resilience. It's about going through hard times and coming out on top and not letting the world drag you down and not and keep on fighting for what you know is right. Even if you're a girl, it doesn't matter. Your gender doesn't matter. Well, your gender, you shouldn't let what other people think limit what you can be. And I believe that is the basic message of the book. And it also connects a lot of the injustices done in the Japanese occupation, which is very interesting to learn and definitely better than reading out of a textbook. And like always, your book quester, Errand of a Quester, it is a very good book I would highly recommend to read. It teaches you all about the Korean War, and it, sent, it gives you, it inspires you to fight against a world who's trying to pull you down. Thank you, bye.